Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's great books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 200 of the great books over the next 10 years and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each of the great books. Today, I'm going to cover The Greek Way by Edith Hamilton. This is book 37 for my 2023 reading list. Well, I paired this book with Mythology by Edith Hamilton. I covered that in the previous podcast episode. And these two books provide an incredible introduction to both the Greeks and to Greek literature. So I'm currently reading through the great books. I've made a list of 200, and I'm calling it The Great Books Plus to where I pair a, a great book with a, a guidebook of sorts. And so this is one of these guides. Guidebooks, and it, it's going to cover a bunch of books. It's it's kind of the guidebook for all of Greek literature, if you will. Uh, and same with mythology. So mythology, which which was the previous book, that is more about the gods. And the the brilliance of that book is that it it tells the entire story of the main gods. And so when you're reading Greek literature, you will come across little sections of it, or you'll just be thrown right into the story. And you, you don't necessarily have the backstory right there to reference of what, what was happening with this particular god. So the, the brilliance of mythology, that book, is that you get the full story there. And so it's very helpful to read before you dig into Greek literature. This, the, this book, The Greek Way, is is also helpful just because it, it provides the idea of of greek overall greek thought like what 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 were they what were they trying to accomplish what how did they live how did they how did they think and then she so it's kind of that type of an introduction and then she goes into individual authors so these are authors that i'm going to be reading coming up and the way i've set up my reading project is that i want to read the source material first so before I read the guidebooks, I want to read the source material first. I don't want these guidebooks influencing what I what I think the first go around. I do want to have that context, but afterwards. However, with this one, I think it's very important, and, and I, I, I would suggest reading these books by Edith Hamilton before you get into the Greek literature, just because it's a, it's a very helpful roadmap just of, of where, where you're going to be going. And I expect to have both of these books right on my bookstand as I, I spend the next year reading through Greek literature, because it, it, they'll, they'll both be very handy reference materials. And I think the benefit is of reading them before the Greek literature as opposed to after. So I will let you know throughout this project when that is the case. I don't expect it to be the case very often, but but in this in this case, it, that it, I think it, that's true. So why is this important? Why, why are the Greeks important? Why they lived 2,500 years ago? Like what what do we possibly have to learn from them in our modern age? Well, Edith Hamilton did a fantastic job in this book of articulating the reason why, and, and here's what she said. Though the outside of human life changes much, the inside changes little, end quote. So just just think of that. Yes, there, there, if, if we were transported 2,500 years ago, a, a lot would look, look differently from, from just going around and, and what life was like and what jobs and, and how people viewed each other and all that. But inside of the person changes little. I thought that was a very helpful distinction just in knowing what, what's, what things change and what remains relatively the same. Later on, when Edith Hamilton is talking about Thucydides, she says this about him. He reasoned that since the nature of the human mind does not change any more than the nature of the human body, circumstances swayed by human nature are bound to repeat themselves. And in the same situation, men are bound to act in the same way unless it is shown to them that, a, that such a course in other days ended disastrously. End quote. So Thucydides is writing about the war between the Spartans and the Greeks. And uh, or the Athenians, and so he, he, the, one of the reasons he's doing that is to show that human nature uh, is not going to change all that much, and so you can you can learn from that, even if that is for us twenty five hundred years ago. This book, even further back from that, is a book about the Greek miracle, what Edith Hamilton calls the Greek miracle, and she said something new happened, and she talks a lot about. The reason for that, in, in a lot of it goes down to this, in that mind and spirit were forged together. 
And so here are a couple quotes along that line. This one from page 18. Mind and spirit together make up that which separates us from the rest of the animal world. And then on page 250, life is what the spirit is concerned with, the individual. Abstractions from life are what the mind is concerned with, the classified, the type. The Greeks were concerned with both, end quote. Their stories and their plays tell us more than we can learn from history about the Greeks. This is another big point from Edith Hamilton. So let me just read a part here and um, stick with me. This is uh, a little... Well, no, th this one's not long. I've got, I've got, I've got a longer one coming up. Uh, so here, here we go. The golden deeds of a nation, however mythical, throw a clear light upon its standards and ideals. They are the revelation that cannot be mistaken of the people's conscience, of what they think men should be like. Their stories and their plays tell us more about them than all their histories. End quote. I found that that quote to be helpful just because I, I just read Herodotus's histories. And so... Yes, there's a lot to learn from that. I, I absolutely adored the histories by Herodotus. But what Edith Hamilton is saying here is, as I move from Herodotus to Greek literature, she is telling me I will probably learn more about the Greeks from Thucydides and Arist Aristophanes than from Herodotus. I, I, I'm, I'm curious. I, I'm, I'm wondering if that will be the case, and I, and I look forward to uh, exploring these things as I read them. All right, here comes the longer paragraph that I want to read, and this comes at the beginning of the book. But this, this is just a very, this is a, a good summation of, of, of what the book is like. And so here, here we go. Stick with me. This is, this is gold. Of all that the Greeks did, only a very small part has come down to us, and we have no means of knowing if we have their best. It would be strange if we had. In the convulsions of that world of long ago, there was no law that guaranteed to art the survival of the fittest. But this little remnant preserved by the haphazard of chance shows the high watermark reached in every region of thought and beauty the Greeks entered. No sculpture comparable to theirs, no buildings ever more beautiful, no writings superior. Prose, always late of development, they had time only to touch upon, but they left masterpieces." History has yet to find a greater exponent than Thucydides. Outside of the Bible, there is no poetical prose that can touch Plato. In poetry, they are all but supreme. No epic is to be mentioned with Homer. No odes to be set beside Pindar. Of the four masters of the tragic stage, three are Greek, and the other is Shakespeare. Little is left of all this wealth of great art. The sculptures, defaced and broken into bits, have crumbled away. The buildings, the buildings are fallen. The paintings gone forever. Of the writings, all lost, but a very few. We have only the ruin of what was. The world has had no more than that for well on to 2,000 years. Yet these few remains of the mighty structure have been a challenge and an incitement to men ever since, and they are among our possessions today, which we value as most precious. There is no danger now that the world will not give the Greek genius full recognition. Greek achievement is a fact universally acknowledged. End quote. That is, that is fantastic and just really gives a scope of what we're looking at here. Also pointing out that we have such a very small amount of what they probably actually created. This is a book of comparison. Uh, it's almost comparative literature in a way to where everything she talks about is in comparison. So at the beginning, we're, to we're told about Greeks compared to other civilizations, other civilizations at the time and then other civilizations earlier. When, we, when she gets to the section on the authors, she compares them to other authors that we know. So she'll compare the tragedy writers to Shakespeare. Uh, she'll, she'll compare other writers to Milton. And that is just so helpful uh, because she'll, she'll just point out different things. And, and just through that comparison throughout the book, it really helps to define what set the Greeks apart. So I, I'm reading the, the Iliad right now, and, and there's a lot of talk that Homer was using the Iliad to, to, in a way, define the Greeks. And perhaps part of it was the Greeks kind of coming into their own, but, but also uh, that, that was, it was almost the definition of, of the Greeks. Like, you know, what, what, are, what, is, what are the Greeks like? And, and you, you almost have to compare them 
to the Trojans to, to get that definition. You have to con- compare them to other people. And so that's what Edith, Edith Hamilton is is doing in, the, in this book. It was written in 1930, so we're, we're almost coming up on the 100-year the anniversary of the book. As for initial re- uh, reaction, there are so many I- good ideas here in this book that set the framework for Greek thought in literature. I, I just think that this will be such a helpful guide in kind of directing my thoughts as as I as I proceed forward in Greek literature. And that's something that I will probably in, be in for the next the next year. Uh, I'm, I'm reading Homer now, the next two months, and then next year I'll be reading through a lot of the, the Greek literature and getting into Plato and, and Aristotle. Uh, the, other, the other thing is uh, I, I plan to, to reference this again before I go into the other authors like Euripides and, and Plato. There's, there's different chapters on each of these authors. So I plan to to reference this again, just right before I start reading those authors. As for reading stats, this is a 258 page book. It took me eight and a half hours to read it. uh, And I share that just so you have an idea of how long it might take you to read this book. This this, uh, episode will have two more segments. So the the next segment will just be a series of things that that stood out to me while reading the book. And then segment three is my one thing, my one key takeaway from The Greek Way by Edith Hamilton. All right, in this segment, I'm going to cover four different areas, uh, four different buckets of, of content. And the first will be just the Greek simplicity. So what does that mean? How did it apply to different areas? The next section, helpful stuff, just uh, like 10 or uh, maybe 11 or 12 things that just really stuck out to me. I just kind of short little snippets that I'll go through. The third is what Aristotle said on happiness that, that I think is just absolutely fantastic and something that I will probably reference quite often going forward. And then the fourth section in this segment will be changes I made to this reading project as a result of reading the Greek way. So let's start off with Greek simplicity. I'm going to start with a, a paragraph here. The special characteristic of the Greeks was their power to see the world clearly, and at the same time as beautiful. Because they were able to do this, they produced art distinguished from all other art by an absence of struggle, marked by a calm and serenity, which is theirs alone. There is, it seems to assure us, a region where beauty is truth, truth, beauty, end quote. That, I, I wanted to start off with that, just talks this book talks a lot about truth and beauty and, and that's something that that uh, that comes up quite a bit and it's something that is the the overarching goal for my reading project I, I say that I am reading I, I'm seeking truth and beauty through the world's great books that's that's my motto for this this project so when I see those words come up um, uh, and Edith Hamilton will often in this book talk about goodness and beauty, but then also truth and beauty as well. When, I just perk up when I when I see those things, and and so th- that was throughout this book. So let's other examples here of Greek simplicity. So she talks in, at the beginning. She has uh, uh, chapters on architecture and on on writing and, and different different aspects of the Greek. And so here's what she said about Greek simplicity in terms of architecture. Here is the Greek miracle. This absolute simplicity of structure is alone in majesty of beauty among all the temples and cathedrals and palaces of the world, end quote. And and we see that. I mean, we see buildings all here in in, I'm I'm in Franklin, Tennessee, and there are are buildings all over that are that are made to look like uh, Greek architecture. And they're, they're using the the Greek pillars and and uh, just, you know, you know, when you see Greek architecture and we still have it so much among us. And, and the beauty of it is in its simplicity. And so I loved pointing that she pointed that out. And we still have examples of their architecture, you know, their original, but then so many uh, copies of it in, in cities all over the world. And then in writing, she says this of their simplicity, clarity and simplicity of statement, the watchwords of the thinker were the Greek poets watchwords too, end quote. And I loved that just because I, I appreciate it so much when, and, and I think it, it's a certain level of genius when somebody is able to take a very complex topic or subject and, and pull pull out the most important pieces of that, but then to describe it in a way that that is 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 beautiful, but then also it, it gets to the root of the of the issue, and and that's what she said the Greeks were able to do. The cl- clarity and simplicity of statements. Uh, so it not only tells a good writer, it tells a good thinker as well. 
Here's uh, an example of where she contrasts Shakespeare with uh, the Greeks. So the English method, and, and in parentheses, I put Shakespeare here. So the English method is to fill the mind with beauty. The Greek method was to set the mind to work. She talks about that a lot, even with, with leisure. Uh, leisure, the idea of leisure for, for Greeks, and I'll, I'll get into this in, in the next helpful stuff area but but it's it's where we get our word school and and it's it's this idea of of working you're not you're not sitting on a couch watching tv you are actively engaging the mind that is the greek ideal of of leisure here's another thing along these lines lovers of beauty without having lost the taste for simplicity this was something that pericles said and was written by thucydides lovers of beauty without having lost the taste for simplicity and let me read one one thing here. Um, a Greek temple makes the spectator aware of the wideness and the wonder of sea and sky and mountain range, as he could not be if that shining marvel, marvel of white stone were not there in sharp relief against them. And in the same way, a Greek tragedy brings before us the strangeness that surrounds us, the dark unknown of life our, our life is bounded by, through the suffering of a great soul given to us so simply and so powerfully, we know in it all human anguish and the mystery of pain, end quote. I, I love that. And, and um, it's an intriguing idea that, that, that a building can actually complement the, the scenery. And in, in what, what she says at the beginning here, a Greek temple makes the spectator aware of the wideness and the wonder of sea and sky and mountain range, as he could not be if that shining marvel of white stone were not there in sharp relief against them. And then she relates that to the, the Greek tragedies. But that, oh, that is such a, a, a neat thing to think about. Like, you, you've seen some of these 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 Greek buildings and, and they are like, I mean, the Parthenon is, you know, it's on top of this hill in, in Athens, Greece. Can you imagine that not being there? I mean, that, that it, it, it's, um, it, it almost enhances that, that hill. Uh, and, and she, she says that of other Greek architecture as well. So just the, the thought that went into not, not even just the building and the simplicity and the beauty of the, the building, but the placement of that to enhance the, the area that so much of what we, we see around us does not do that. It, it hinders, it hinders the beauty. Uh, so just, I, I love that. that. So tying in Greek simplicity with, with a actually enhancing the, the environment in a way. All right, now on to helpful stuff. So I'm just going to, I've got a few things here. I'm just going to kind of go through and read them. A lot of these are just kind of quick quotes that I'll, I'll comment on. Wretched people, toiling people do not play. Nothing like the Greek games is conceivable in Egypt or Mesopotamia. So Edith Hamilton says the, the Greeks were the first people to play. So we have their Olympics, we have their, their uh, theater, and we still have these things today. And she says these were the first people to play. I mean, think, think the Egyptians. Were they, were they playing? What about the Mesopotamians did, uh, or the people of Mesopotamia? Did, do we have evidence of them playing? And, and yeah, I, I'm sure we do. And I know of like even toys that, that we have from, from Mesopotamia, uh, uh, graves and that kind of thing. So it, it wasn't, but, but her point is that even with the Romans, like their stadiums were for, were for death. They were there for these gladiatorial games. There, it, there was not this aspect of play in that. There was this aspect of, of viewing something that you almost shouldn't be viewing. It was, it was that titillating. And, and so the Greeks brought these games that we still have, we still have the Olympics. We, you know, we, that was a big part of their culture. What does it mean that, that this culture were the first people in the world to play? But that was a cool thing to, to think on. Here is what I, I just referenced earlier. Our word for school comes from the Greek word for leisure. Of course, reason to the Greek, given leisure, a man will employ it in thinking and finding out about things. Leisure and the pursuit of knowledge, the connection, was inevitable to a Greek. End quote. I love that. Next up. The influence of the English Bible has had its share in making the Greek way hard for us. The language and the style of it have become to us those appropriate to religious expression. In Greek religious poetry, which makes up much of the lyrical part of the tragedies, perhaps the greatest of all Greek poetry is completely unhebraic. Hebrew and Greek are poles apart. Hebrew poetry poetry is directed to the emotions. It is designed to make the hearer feel, not think. Therefore, it is a poetry based on reiteration. End quote. 
I, I loved that. That that was very helpful for me. There, there's a lot of talk right now, just even in churches, of what types of songs should people sing. Do we just sing the same words over and over, or do do you sing hymns that that have, you know, very rich words and that kind of thing? And and I loved this just this difference of it of of the reason for repetition. Even the reason for repetition in poetry, is to is to direct to the emotions. It's to make it's to make the hearer feel, not to think. That, that was a helpful, again, just Edith Hamilton is comparing things throughout this book. And that, that was a very helpful comparison when she's comparing the Hebrew Bible and uh, works, works of Greek literature. Now let's talk about civilization. Civilization, a much abused word, stands for a high matter quite apart from telephones and electric lights. It is a matter of imponderables, of delight in the things of the mind, of love, of beauty, of honor, grace, courtesy, delicate feeling. Where imponderables are the things of first importance, there is the height of civilization. And if, at the same time, the power to act exists unimpaired, Human life has reached a level seldom attained and very seldom surpassed. Few individuals are capable of the achievement. Periods of history which have produced such men in sufficient numbers to stamp their age are rare indeed. End quote. It's beautiful. I, I love that. Uh, civilization, a matter of imponderables. The delight in the things of the mind, the love of beauty, of honor, grace, courtesy, delicate feeling. Where they are of first importance there you will see the height of civilization. The chapter on Herodotus, I, I thoroughly enjoyed having just finished Herodotus. And I always, I, 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 part of this project for me, this reading project is just to, to, to notice what I'm thinking while I'm reading, because I guess for a lot of my life, I just didn't know if what I was thinking were not necessarily the right things, but just, am I getting good things out of these books? And so when I read a book and then I see other people comment on the same things, it just, it gives me hope that I'm, I'm, I'm on the right track of some sorts here. So I loved reading these things. So I'm going to highlight three things she said about Herodotus. And these are, these are all quite short. There have been a few men who ever, who wondered more than Herodotus did. The word is perpetually on his pen. A wonder was told me in the land. There are 10,000 wonders, wonderful deeds. Those it is a thing to be wondered at. In, in this disposition, he was the true child of his age, the great age of Greece. I loved that. I, I, I commented that on, on, in, in the episode I did about Herodotus, just his, his, his curiosity of things, just, it, and then you got curious about these things, and it, and it was just a delight to read. So I, I loved that she pointed that out. Next up, bits of information that have nothing to do with what he is writing about keep straying in, but he is so intensely interested in them himself, the reader, reader's interest is caught too. And I obviously noticed that quite a bit. And then here we go. Only the last part of the history has to do with the Persian Wars. Two thirds of the book are taken up with Herodotus's journeys and what he learned on them. These earlier chapters have the effect more and more as one reads on of a slowly unrolling stage setting. End quote. So yes, the Herodotus' histories are, are ultimately about the clash of civilizations and, uh, the, and the, the lead up to the Persian Wars. But the Persian Wars just take up a third of that. And, and it's exciting. You're reading about the battles and, and it's, it's, it's exhilarating. But two thirds of the book are, are actually kind of this buildup. But it's so fascinating. He, he just follows all these tra rabbit trails of curiosity that you, you, you're hooked. You're hooked. All right. What is freedom? Here we go. Freedom strictly limited by self-control. That was the idea of Athens at her greatest. Her artists embodied it. Her democracy did not. Athenian art and Athenian thought survived the test of time. Athenian democracy became imperial and failed. Uh, sorry, it became imperial and failed. End quote. So freedom strictly limited by self-control. Her artists embodied it, but her democracy did not. We still have the art their democracy fell. It's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, th and this is, again, a chapter kind of about the, the, the fall of Athens. So vices by then, Thucydides said, were esteemed as virtues. The very meaning of words changed. Deceit was praised as shrewdness. Rec recklessness held to be courage. Loyalty, moderation, generosity scorned as proofs of weakness. And quote that, uh, that could almost be in a newspaper about our times today. 
the, here's a quote from Thucydides. I picked up on this, uh, and, and I'll tie it to something else. The cause of all these evils was, was the desire for power, which greed and ambition inspire. The cause of all these evils was the, was the desire for power, which greed and ambition inspire, end quote. That made me think of a book I, I read last year. It was the last book of 2022 called The Dawn by Yoram Hazoni. And he made that point. It's a, it's a book that, that delves into the book of Esther, but kind of from a political point of view. And, and he said the, the main driver there it was a, a thirst for power. And, and, and so we see that in the book of Esther, and then we see this in Thucydides as well that, that he pointed out. All right, moving on. None but a poet can write a tragedy, for tragedy is nothing less than pain transmuted into exalta ex exaltation by the alchemy of poetry. None but a poet can write a tragedy, for a tragedy is nothing less than pain transmuted into exaltation by the alchemy of poetry. End quote. I'm just going to leave that one as it. That, that's it's just beautiful. So a lot of chapters on tragedy because three of the greatest tragedy writers of all time were Greek. So here we've got another thing. Why is death the ordinary uh, of, a, of the ordinary man a wretched, chilling thing which we turn from? While the death of a hero, always tragic, warms us with a sense of quickened life. End quote. That's a question Edith Hamilton poses. And she, she answers it, but I, I thought the question itself was, was fantastic. An ordinary, an ord, ordinary man dies, and it's something we kind of turn from. But the death of a hero, that, that inspires us. Why? Great, great question there. All right, two more. This is Euripides speaking. He said, if gods do evil, then they are not gods. And Edith Hamilton points out that this is essentially a rejection of man's creating God in his own image. And um, last episode about mythology, uh, that was one of my key points is just Edith Hamilton said, the Greeks created their gods in their own image. So before this, in, in other civilizations, you have these you have these gods that are otherworldly. You know, they, they don't look human at all. They've got different parts of animals or they're just these fearsome creatures. And you get to Greece and the gods are, are very human. They have jealousies like the humans. They have, they have anger and, and they're fighting amongst each other. They're, they're getting married. They're, they're cheating. They're doing all of the things that humans do. And so uh, Edith Hamilton's point was that the Greeks made the god in their own image. And then Euripides kind of kills the gods in a way that says, if gods do evil, then they are not gods. And what we see in the Iliad and, and uh, these different works is the, the, the gods are not like, you don't look to them for goodness in the sense of, okay, I, I want to be like them. I mean, they're just as bad as humans, if, if not worse. And so uh, he, this is Euripides' rejection of man creating God in his own image. So that was interesting. Last thing here is just that there are no, there is no, there's no Greek Bible uh, in the sense that came from them. So here, here are a few things that she wrote. Greek religion was developed not by priests, nor by prophets, nor by saints, nor by any set of men who were held to be removed from the ordinary run of life because of a superior degree of holiness. It was developed by poets and artists and philosophers, all of them people who instinctively leave thought and imagination free, and all of them, in Greece, men of practical affairs. The Greeks had no authoritative sacred book, no creed, no Ten Commandments, no dogmas. The very idea of orthodoxy was unknown to them. They had no theologians to draw up sac sacrosanct definitions of the eternal and the infinite. And, and I'll stop, stop it there. But just an interesting thing to think about. So we've got the, the pantheon, we've got the, these gods, but there's, there's not this sacred book. There's no creed, no Ten Commandments, no dogma. And, and the priests are very rarely even mentioned in, in literature. And when they are mentioned, it's not necessarily in like a, a, a great a way. Like they're not, they're not looked up to in, in the same way as, as other cultures of that time or, or earlier. So that, that was just a key key point in, in something to consider as well, just in going through Greek literature. Now, the third part here uh, is Aristotle on happiness. And he said, happiness is activity of the soul. Activity of the soul. I I wrote this down. I, I, uh, I think this is going to be one of those ideas that I come back to a lot as just a very helpful definition. So it's not activity of the body. It's not activity of the mind. These, these 
may, may perhaps be part of the soul, but the activity of the soul in, in uh, think of thinking of the soul as the receptor for things of truth and beauty. What are you doing activity wise for the soul? It, and and it's it these are things kind of like as a byproduct of pursuing these higher things. It's not you, you don't you don't seek after happiness. You seek you seek after other things, and, and happiness will be a byproduct. But that definition, I I really think I'm going to be coming back to this a lot. I think you're going to hear this a lot from me going forward. And it I, to me it was a very helpful thing to consider. And it's it's something you could think about for probably the rest of your life. But happiness equals activity of the soul. I loved that. Final thing here, here are three changes I made to my reading project as a result of this book. I, I've got rules in place. I've got, you know, the idea of where I want to go, but it's a constantly changing thing. And that makes it hard for people to, if they want to join in, in, in what I'm reading, because I'm, I'm just making constant changes based on what I'm reading and, and all that. So here uh, are, are three changes that I made. I, I changed the reading order of, of a few books. And that was based on reading this and, and seeing who was referencing who. So before I had Aristophanes before Euripides, but what Edith Hamilton points out is that um, uh, Euripides uh, or Aristophanes quotes Euripides and is talking about what he said. So I I, I wanted to switch those so I, I could see those things in, in play. The second thing I did is I added Pindar, Pindar to the list, and he was a Greek author. I, d I didn't see him in a, on a lot of the great books lists that I was looking through, but he wrote, o he wrote odes to the, the athlete. And this, that was referenced. There's a whole chapter about Pindar here. So I, I, um, I added that in. The final thing is I added Euripides's Trojan women, uh, the, the tragedy play by Euripides. I did not have that on my original list, but that one is referenced quite often in this book as well. So I added that in. Those are the four uh, things that really stuck out. I know that was a long segment. Thanks for sticking with me. Uh, in the next segment here, I'll get into the one thing. All right, here's the one thing, the, the one thing I pulled, the one thing that's, that stuck out the most in this book. And, and I think it was that idea that this is something new. We are coming to the Greeks. I'm about to start reading Greek literature. And Edith Hamilton's point here is that this, this marks a big shift. Not only have they influenced us tremendously, and we can look back and see all that, but this was a, this was a turning point in history. We had not seen a lot of this before. And what's so neat is that as I've been reading, I, I'm so glad I'm doing the, this reading project in order from oldest to newest, because I've been reading about what Edith Hamilton was talking about. I've been reading about India. I've been reading about Egypt, ancient Egypt. I've been reading about Mesopotamia. And she pulls all these things. She says, you know, when, you, when you're learning about these things, did you notice this? Did you notice that they didn't have this, that when the Greeks did this, this was something brand new? And that was so helpful because when when we read it from our vantage point now, a lot of these things are are in the air, and, it, and it's hard for us to know. Hey, the Greeks they, they they started this, or this was something that that they brought about. And the thing that stuck out to me the most was just the Greek ability to see be beauty and truth. And you know, you can pull maybe perhaps some threads from some of these ancient civilizations and how that led to this. But this this was just such a marked difference, something new happened here. So let me just share a couple quotes on this. One day, this knowledge of something irredeemably wrong in the world came to a poet with his poet's power to see beauty in the truth of human life. And the first tragedy was written. It's the first thing. And then the second um, part here, there's a couple quotes on this page. Uh, she's talking about Oshlis here. He was the poet of a new era. He bridged the tremendous gulf between the poetry of the beauty of the outside world and the poetry of the beauty of the pain of the world. Life for him was an adventure, perilous indeed, but men are not made for safe havens. The fullness of life is in the hazards of life, end quote. I loved that. Uh, I, I meant to share a, a quote earlier on something of what Plato commented on Egyptian art. And again, this is one thing that as I was reading about Egypt, uh, I mentioned this in the podcast episode I did for them, you're looking at 3000 years of history. And the, the thing that stuck out to me the most, uh, and I, I know this would probably make some historians cringe, but is just the, the relative stability 
of Egypt in the sense of art and thought. For 3,000, I mean, think about 3,000, think of how much art has changed just in the last 100 years in, in the world. And you look at a period of 3,000 years, and there, there are kind of rules in place, like this is what art is, this is how you do art, and you don't deviate from that. And I compared that to, to, to showing this Akhenaten, this, this one uh, pharaoh who, who flipped everything on its head. And that was such a, a shock to Egypt's system that his, his, uh, his, the person after him, which is Tutankhamun, flipped everything back immediately. And, and went back to how everything used to be. Like, a, that was such a shock to the system. And it, and it really showed how things did not change uh, very much. Yes, the, yes, there was change. And you can, you can look over 3,000 years and see some slight changes. But on the whole, and compared to what we know, 3,000 years is a tremendously long period of time. And there was relatively little, little change in that. And here's what Plato said on that, on that. In Egypt, the forms of excellence were long since fixed and patterns of them displayed in the temples. No painter or artist is allowed to innovate on the traditional forms or invent new ones. To this day, no alteration is allowed. None at all. Their works of art are painted or molded in the same forms which they had 10,000 years ago. End quote. I, uh, I loved that. I just love that Plato, of all people, pointed, pointed that out and, and, and saw that uh, in his day as well. Uh, so again, that contrast of, of what the Greeks, the Greeks ability to see beauty and truth to, to do a marked difference. We, we see their artwork and it's artwork of human beings. It's not these colossal pyramids. It's not these colossal statues of, of like impenetrable, but it's like that statue looks like a person. And that was a mix. That was a, a big difference. So to recap, this is this will be a, a book that I have on my book stand. It'll be something as as over the next year I go through Greek literature. It's be, it'll be something I reference quite often. And it's it's something I plan to read before I, I get into some of these specific authors. I I mark up my books like crazy, um, as as uh, Spencer Clavin just said. He treats his books savagely. I loved that description, and that's what I do with my books. I'm underlining, I'm starring, I'm I'm writing notes in the back. I can pick up any book out of my my shelf and, and look at the back and see what stood out to me the most. But I only put stars by stuff that that really really move me or or uh impact me or or it, it's kind of a new idea or a new way of thinking about it and so I'll, I'll underline things but if there's a star next to it it's a big idea if there are two stars next to it it's a su super big idea and just to give reference like for a lot of the books i read there might be two or three stars in the entire book and for this book i mean i, I just flip through and i'm just seeing star 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 double star double star 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 just all over so there were there was a ton in this book it's a relatively short book i highly recommend it and i highly recommend it if you are about to get into greek literature please read this and read mythology by the same author before you delve in i think it'll really help you if you would indulge me i, I want to read a brief history of the world here as written by Edith Hamilton. And, you know, if this is not your thing, if you've run out of time, feel free to close this out. But I thought this was so fantastic that um, it, it, it is one paragraph, but, um, but it, it's a long one. So if you are willing to stick with me, I think you will enjoy this. When the Greek city-state came to an end in the be bewilderment and insecurity that followed, men turned away from the visible world of the mind to the Stoics and the unshakable security of their kingdom of the spirit. In like manner during the first centuries after Christ, the trend of the church, poor and weak and persecuted, was strongly away from the visible. Those were the years that saw the, the anchorites of the desert, the saints who lived upon a pillar. They saw self-torture and self-mutilization exalted. The things that are seen began to be viewed not only as negligible, but as evil, drawing men away from the pure contemplation of the invisible. With the coming of the great monastic orders, the extreme tendency was checked. Learning and art had a place and austerities were moderated, but the misery that underlay the lovely superstructure of the Middle Ages worked as misery has always done, turned men against the bitter reality of life, and freedom of thought was an unknown as if Greece had never lived." 
With the Renaissance and the rediscovery of Greece, the pendulum swung far over to the other side. Grim wretchedness had ceased to be a matter of course in the Italian cities. People had begun to enjoy themselves and they were using their minds. They demanded liberty to think, to love life and the beauty of earth. But in their turn, they ended by regarding as negligible the things that are not seen and they made their gain finally at the cost of morality and ethics. The Reformation asserted both morality and man's right to think for himself, but denied beauty and the right of enjoyment. The last great swing of the pendulum was in the late 19th century when the battle was fought for scientific truth. And in the victory, religion and art and the claims of the spirit were all slighted or discarded. End quote. I mean, just a one paragraph sweep through history since the Greeks. That was, uh, that was tremendous. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you find in, in this book. So I highly recommend it. It's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I would love to hear from you. You can email me at eric at booksoftitans.com. That's eric with a K, so E-R-I-K at booksoftitans.com. If you are a lover of Greek literature, if you uh, share your excitement of the Greeks and want to, to share any of that with me, if you got something out of Edith Hamilton that I've missed, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear that from you. Just a quick side note that this one's called The Greek Way. There, Edith Hamilton also wrote The Roman Way, and I'll probably use that as my guidebook before delving in to the works of of the the romans please uh follow books of titans on instagram or twitter you can also go to the website sign up for the newsletter there that's the best way to keep in touch i'll let you know of of recent podcast episodes and then just uh usually once a month i'll, I'll share what's what's going on in the reading project itself so i will be back either next week or the week after to discuss another book until then keep reading keep learning and keep listening i'm out